would like to now introduce you with our speaker, Jennifer Horwath, who is the business, who is the business analytic and assistant and consultant from Alberta, Canada, the owner of the Hearts Lifted Analytical Company. And today, Jennifer is going to share her experience and her knowledge. And I do believe that each and every one of you will find something useful for you in order to update your brand. Jennifer, thank you very much for joining us. You're looking at this mark, Amazon. What comes to mind? What does it make you think of? So for some people, it may be, you know, fast, you can get everything you want. Um, even their logo is from A to Z. So, um, but, you know, it also doesn't really stand for, um, doesn't really stand for, you know, uh, being good to the economy. They'll ship kind of at any cost. But when, uh, when you first look at that, you have all of these feelings about that brand, which was never intended, but they uh, never really necessarily thought for you to feel because that's based on your experience. So a brand is co-created between a company and the uh, person, the customers who are experiencing it. So if you look at, you know, essentially the same product here, cup of coffee, one from Starbucks, one from McDonald's, um, people have really specific preferences. So some people really like McDonald's coffee and some people really like Starbucks coffee, but they're essentially the same product. And what differentiates them is the brand. You know, why will people spend more for Starbucks branded coffee versus a McDonald's coffee? That all comes down to branding and why it's important to invest in your brand. So here's a brand I know that you don't know. And in fact, most people in Edmonton, where I'm from, don't know it. But it's a little coffee shop um, called Wild Rack. They have lovely coffee, lovely service, and it's just a cozy place to go. And I always like to share a logo um, and a brand that you're not familiar with, because for most people, that's where your brand is. Your brand doesn't yet have the awareness or the following um, but all those brands that I showed you before, they started where you are. And so if you are consistent and keep going, then your brand will become more, uh, more top of mind than, uh, than it is now. So don't get discouraged if people don't recognize your brand. It's a process of which we call brand building. One of my favorite authors is Seth Godin, and he art says that a brand is really about that set of expectations of what we think, our memories, our stories, and our relationships that all together determines whether or not you, a customer would buy a product or a service one another. So what I'm going to do today is uh, talk a bit about why a brand matters and then all the elements that you should think about when you're building your brand. So one of the reasons why um, strong brands matter, in addition to having the awareness of the brand and helping sales that way, is that it also creates a high emotional connection. So if you have a strong brand, people are likely to purchase more and they're likely to pay a premium. So investing in your brand and building that your know, like, and trust can really help build your business in terms of being able to, um, in terms of being able to build loyalty. So uh, an example, uh, I imagine Lego is a global brand. I grew up playing with it, my kids did. And uh, on the right, this Brickyard is a comparable brand, um, but they are not well known. And so when I ask people, which one would you rather invest in? Most people say Lego because they have a stronger brand uh, attachment to, to that brand. And so you can see immediately that um, the value of building a brand 
All right, brand. These are the elements that break up, um, make up a brand. So all together, um, these are the areas. Sorry, was, did I have a question? No, okay, I'll keep going. Um, these are the areas of a brand that as a company you get to manage. Um, so some things are within our control as, as small business owners or business owners. Um, and then some things are based on what the customer uh, experiences. So I'm going to walk through each of these brand elements. And at the end, I'm happy to take questions. So the first one on that is called the brand promise. And this is what you're bringing to your customer to earn their confidence, loyalty, and trust. Usually it's very uh, simple, compelling benefits. It's very credible and something you can keep every time. And it's something that's beyond just what we call baseline. So it's beyond just a quality product or professionalism or good customer service. It stands for something a bit more. I have a few examples to show you what I mean. So creating happiness through magical experiences. This one's Disney. And immediately when I share this, um, people can immediately say, oh, that is Disney, like Disneyland. And it's very clear that that company is one of the only ones in the world that truly delivers happiness through ma uh, magical experiences. This other brand promise to bring inspiration and innovation to every athlete in the world, that's Nike's. And they do go out of their way to make sure that they're investing in innovation and they hire um, athletic spokespeople who are inspiring and, um, and sometimes even a little you know, controversial because they want to inspire those people who um, may not see themselves normally in sports. So you can see how these brand promises really stand out and they're really unique to the company. Um, an inexpensive, familiar and kiss, consistent meal delivered quickly in a clean environment. That is McDonald's. It's very clear whether you are in Canada or in China or in Ukraine, the experience of McDonald's is really consistent. And that's part of the reason why people continue to go there. And uh, when we could and when we can travel again, people will look for that um, as a way to find an inexpensive and consistent meal. Mm. So this was uh, FedEx's. Um, promise, which was, we'll get you your package to you by 10.30 a.m. the next day. And the problem was, is that they used this as part of their advertising. And so it wasn't an internal brand promise. So for example, um, Disney, they don't go around saying, we create happiness. They just do it. They show it and they deliver on it. And uh, FedEx used this, will you get we'll get your package to you by 10.30 a.m. the next day. And the reality is they couldn't deliver on that brand promise. And uh, they needed to, you know, that really hurt their brand because they set expectations that they couldn't deliver on. And so they had to change that. Uh, sometimes another place where brand promises go, go sideways, uh, especially in Canada, is buying used uh, cars. Uh, so there's this, <coughs> pardon me, this photo of uh, this, you know, minivan that someone's bought and it says uh, Norman Chrysler Jeep Dodge lied to us to make this sale. So this idea that when you consistently deliver on your brand promise, that really helps to build your brand and loyalty, but if you break it, it can be really damaging to your brand. And so people or brands uh, promises fail if it was never kept, so it didn't happen, or maybe there was unclear expectations. Um, maybe there was 
I guess, in terms of the, uh, in terms of maybe buying a vehicle, it's not clear, you know, when you will get that, how much it will be, or maybe there's too many conditions. So the customer has to jump through a lot of hoops to eventually truly take advantage of that brand promise. Um, there could be a delay in fulfilling promise. And I see this a lot with uh, the internet, especially, especially small businesses who are selling on Etsy or another um, marketplace where they will sell their you know, beautiful homemade products, um, but then delay in fulfilling them. And that can really hurt your rankings. And uh, so it's really important to be able to deliver on um, on you know fulfilling that promise and it, it could be as simple as delivering it in a reasonable time or the promise was surpassed by a competitor so as i said these things can really impact your ratings um, and so you want to really try to understand what are you promising to the customer and how can you make sure that you're delivering on it every day all right whoops back one um, So a brand, sorry, yes, a brand story is the next a circle on our hub and spoke and a brand story shares the journey that you're on. Um, so why are you there in the first place? How you're qualified to help people solve their problems and how you do business. And we use stories because it is really sticky and memorable. I always think that small businesses and entrepreneurs actually really benefit from this because their brand story is often a personal story. So whether you're uh, an accountant that, you know, really wanted to help small businesses because you saw your parents struggle and so you didn't want to do, you know, a big corporation, you started your business um, to really be there for small businesses. Or perhaps you have a health product and, you know, you came out by that way because you were feeling really bad. You tried a whole bunch of different things to heal yourself. And in the end, um, you came up with a product that really helped and you, you hope to help others with it. So you can see that by creating a brand story, um, it helps people to relate to you. The other thing too is you often find people's brand stories on their about page on their website. So that's a really great place to put it. And when you're out talking, make sure you share, you know, how you came to be and why it doesn't matter. So here's a kind of a quick outline how to create your own brand story. You want to share a relatable journey. So, you know, struggle, some struggles, some beliefs, your wins, you know, and reveal who the brand is, what it stands for and why. It may be yours. Like I said, a lot of small businesses or entrepreneurs, it's a personal story to how this company was started, but it doesn't need to be. Um, you want to offer value. So what's the key takeaway and how do they benefit from the story, both emotionally and rationally? We know that people buy um, primarily based on emotions and then they rationalize why they bought afterwards. And then in that brand story, usually towards the end, you have a gentle call to action. So learn more, you know, sign up to follow us to receive newsletters or check out this post on our blog or join us on Instagram. So you want to share the story, offer a bit of value, and then encourage people to keep acting and connecting with you. The next circle on our spoken wheel are brand values. And these are usually three to five core values that are really memorable to you. Um, and similar to the brand promise, it's beyond those table stakes of quality product and, um, you know, professionalism, all companies should be delivering that to really, you know, stand behind their brands. Um, brand values are influenced by you, but largely determined by your customers. So um, when we think about McDonald's, um, you know, maybe somebody sees the value of, you know, quick, reliable 
um, experience and product, but then the customers might see it as, you know, unhealthy and, you know, not, a, not good, but uh, the more consistent you are with letting those brand values show up in your marketing, it uh, really helps you to create consistency. And we've definitely seen a, um, a very specific shift that when people believe in the values of your company and the brand, they'll stay loyal to the brand because they see it as part of themselves. So um, I always used to say when I worked for Campbell Soup, like I'm the perfect Campbell Soup lady. I love Campbell Soup. I even have the big cheeks like the kids on the can. Um, you know, it's warm, it's inviting, it's you know, easy to make. And some of those values just reflected, you know, how I like to uh, cook. I'm not a chef. And so it's nice to have that uh, easy to pull out, easy to make. So here are a few examples of companies and their primary brand value. So Amazon, as we talked about in the beginning, is really about ultimate convenience. And Coca-Cola is about happiness. Google is a really around accessible information, or at least that's where they started. But they've really, um, the idea of making everything on the web accessible and at your fingertips was really their core value when they started. Harley Davidson, which is a motorcycle company, they're all about freedom. Home Depot is a hardware store and in in Canada and it's about you know doing it yourself um, so we'll give you all the supplies but it's up to you to kind of do it yourself and they have people on the floor in in the store able to provide a little bit of guidance like oh you should buy this part or you might want to do it this way but it's up to you uh, to do do the project yourself and then IKEA is really about possibility it's around um, when you walk into the big box store, you, there's uh, many different ways to kind of set up little small rooms and um, it shows you the possibility. But then when you go down to purchase, it's a fairly large warehouse and it's up to you to kind of pick and choose what you want to bring home. And then it's the do it yourself. <laughs> uh, a small local company here in Edmonton, I think, has one of the best ways of articulating what their core value is. So their brand name is called Honest Dumplings, and they've really taken honesty to the next level. So this is just a screenshot of their uh, website side by side. Um, and in the text here, it says, why do food companies have websites? We don't know, but here's ours. <laughs> so they're being really honest. We're not sure, but you know, um, and even their little tags underneath each of their social media. Um, you know, when we post food pics, it's cool. Or Facebook, if your mom wants to know what's up. I love how they've taken honest to the next level. And even in their products, they use all natural ingredients. You understand everything that's in there. And um, they've really like owned and stepped into that brand value of being honest. Brand personality. So this is the next bubble on our hub and spoke. And this is really how does your brand show up with human traits or attributes? I always think about if you were to meet your brand at a party, how would you describe them? You know, would they be quiet and meek and consultative? The person who's really listening deeply? Or are they the ones that are, you know, energetic and talking and sharing and connecting? And you'll be able to see your, when you're creating your brand, how that comes together and what works and what doesn't work for your brand. This uh, wheel kind of gives you a sense for maybe how you can see your personality come through. So let's say your company is all about um, 
you know, creating adventures. And maybe that's really around, you know, exploring. And so that uh, brand personality would be quite independent and brave. They're, they don't conform to the normal, they can do it themselves. And so you can see how then with having that personality, that kind of starts to direct how you would write on your website, how, what images would you choose? Uh, so it starts to create a really consistent package of how your brand shows up. I should also mention you'll be getting uh, the slides after both, I believe, in English and translated into Ukrainian. Uh, Ukrainian. So uh, definitely if you want to spend some more time looking at this uh, a little bit closer, you'll have that time. And you can see, you know, kind of where you uh, sit. Also, people ask me, do I only need to pick one? And no, you know, maybe it makes sense to combine a couple of them together. The next circle on, on this is your brand voice. So this is the personality and emotion that's infused with your company's communications and marketing. So how do you sound? Is it very professional and, um, you know, longer, more engaged words? If you're doing a business to business, are you using words that your industry uses but if you were you uh, uh, business to consumer to customer then maybe it's a different language maybe it's more casual and friendly so one of the ways to uh, document this is to write down a few other traits and then define them early or define them further so what does that mean so let's say um my brand voice is really passionate and so when you're passionate, you can be really expressive. You can tell that this is a bit of my own brand voice here. Enthusiastic, action oriented. So when I write, it's very, you know, encouraging and, you know, like, let's go, let's get this done. They'll see that I take action. Um, or maybe you want to have a more authentic approach. So your, the voice, the words, the language that you use would be, you know, more genuine and trustworthy and may give a sense of more, you know, uh, listening or engaging and being direct and not, you know, not necessarily like running uh, around the point that you're trying to make. You're just going to be straight and direct. I, of course, have some examples for you. <laughs> so Skype, uh, an online, um, uh, you know, video phone um, platform. So in their brand book, they clearly articulate, you know, the words they like and the words they don't like. So they clearly say, you know, we like free and share and calls and whole world but we don't like telephony, peer-to-peer, -peer, VoIP, bill. You can immediately sense in even the words they're using what their brand is all about. It's about connection and less about the technology. Great, so moving on to logos. Um, most people think of a logo when they think brand. But as we've already learned, a brand is way more than just your logo. Your logo, however, is important. So it can, uh, it's typically made up of kind of two parts. One is called a, like a graphic or a glyph. In this uh, example, Shopify, which is an online platform uh, actually based out of Ottawa, Canada. Um, they have the shopping bag with the S as their graphic. And the word mark is usually the name of the company. So Shopify. When you are creating a logo or getting a graphic artist to do one, you want to make sure that you have them in different formats. So in full color, uh, in monotone, which means just black or white, 
And then also in reverse. So when you go to put your logo on a black background, it will clearly pop out without that, you know, white box around it. And then also if there's an opportunity to use your graphic as part of your social media um, profile, that's where they've done a really nice job with uh, the Spotify. When you're thinking, another thing about when you're choosing your profile picture for either Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, Twitter, is to be aware that if you're using your full logo, it might not be legible when it's just teeny tiny. So you want to see if maybe there is a, a graphic or a um, color that would really help you to pop and not get, not blend in. Sorry, I'm just going to take a quick drink. The other part of, um, you know, what people typically see as a brand <clears throat> are the fonts. And for your font to look professional, you probably only want to stick with one or with two fonts or font family. I often see great brands or that are using too many fonts and it, that makes it look unprofessional. So just be consistent, pick a couple of font or font families. And so what I mean by font families is, um, here's the example of Arial. So Arial comes in a regular, a regular italic, a bold, a bold italic. And so you can see there's a lot of design options just even within that font family, but there's a cohesiveness because it is the same font. And so, you know, if you're writing on your website, you can use sizes as a way to emphasize. So if you have a heading that should be larger, um, maybe you have a quote that could be in italics, but those could all potentially um, be in the same font family. I gave you a link here, fonts.google.com. Uh, there are a number of web friendly and free fonts. When you're creating online, some fonts uh, that you can buy don't work well online. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that now. But there's, if you're looking for some fonts, uh, fonts.google.com uh, can be a good place to start. So here are some types of fonts. And I always like to you know, clarify this for people because unless you have a design background, you probably don't know this. So the, there, the top one is a serif font. Um, and that's where there's little ticks, little design elements. Um, Times New Roman is one of the more common serif fonts. The next one is a sans serif font, which is without those little ticks and design elements. And Arial is a really common one. <clears throat> um, there's a scripted font, um, which I find is relatively difficult to read online. Uh, so it, you can use it for a headline or, you know, a few words maybe on an image, but it's really quite hard to read. So use that sparingly. And then the last font is a decorative font. And um, I would suggest not using these, I guess, unless you, unless it really applies to your brand because they can also be hard to read and they often don't come across as very professional. Here's an example of how um, the design and the fonts come together. So you can see the headline, the Great Tech Talk, is um, an Open Sans Extra Bold. So Extra Bold, really big, and Open Sans means uh, it's without the decorative um, elements on it. So it's very clean. <clears throat> then for the, um, the author's name, they've used a, a Cooper Hewitt, and then they went back to the Sans. So it gives a sense for um, cohesiveness when you're using similar fonts. But like I said, you want to kind of limit it to two fonts. So you can alternate them a little bit, but still look uh, professional. 
uh, color palette. The next one on our, our circle. So when you're selecting a color palette, um, most companies have three to five colors on average. And you want to select um, kind of three types. One is a base, which is often the same color that's used in your logo. It's a dominant brand. Um, it often matches a bit with your values too. So blue, for example, is a common color uh, used to indicate professionalism. Um, and so if you have that in your, as your part of your color palette, um, that can help uh, indicate or show your, uh, that, that you're professional. So you have your base one and then you have an accent. Uh, you know, one, two of these, uh, they really help to, you know, reflect the brand personality, create a little pop, draw to attention. They can be good for using buttons on your website. So, you know, a, a pop a red or pop a green, um, something that helps to draw people's attention to it. And then there's your neutrals or grounding colors. So these are usually your blacks, whites, grays, browns. Gives you a little bit of breathing space, helps to frame it. Um, and so you can get a sense for not overwhelming people with a bright accent color all over. Or, um, and uh, that will also help to make your brand look professional. I'll even show you a couple of examples of, of color palettes here. So National Geographic, this magazine, you can see that they actually have two different yellows uh, as a way to kind of call out different things. The darker yellow is actually in their logo and um, it's used quite a bit like on their stationery, but um, the blue is also used as buttons on their website. You can see how if you lay out all of your pieces of marketing and communications that they all should have a cohesive look and feel. When you're consistent with your look and feel, it really helps to, you know, build brand awareness and trust and people know that they can rely on you for kind of consistent uh, communication. It's a very, it can be a very subtle thing. It works with the brain's unconscious levels. And, but that's why we put so much emphasis on consistency in design. Here's one that we just developed. Uh, I, at Alberta Women Entrepreneurs, where I am a business advisor part-time, we're launching a program called Bold Leadership, helping women transform their businesses to go online. And so we came up with the branding, we hired an artist, and you can see that she's really done a beautiful job of outlining the brand with the tagline and one without. So you can or cannot have uh, a tagline. It's up to you. You don't need one as part of your logo, but you can. You can see she's used uh, color gradients. So these are kind of our highlight colors. The purple is our AWE purple. And so she's integrated it in this sub brand. And then she's using black and white uh, as a way to create space around it. And here we have our font family. So we're using Myriad Pro and we have a black, a regular and an italic. So you can see how they look slightly different, but they're all kind of uniform. So if you're working with a graphic artist, definitely make sure that you're getting kind of all of these pieces, as well as your logo with all the different um, aspects that we talked about before, with the reverse, um, the, with this bold leadership um, brand, we uh, actually pulled out the B as one of our images. When you pull, when you have a strong brand and you simply pull out the colors and the fonts and some imagery, it's really easy to understand who this is. And so if you uh, were in Canada, you'd immediately say, oh, that's TELUS. That's one of our national uh, phone and internet providers. And I know the people who work 
in their marketing department and they are so bored of this brand and they want to switch it up. But the reality is there's so much value and people instantly recognize this that it would be really detrimental to the brand to move away from it. So when you're starting to get bored of your own brand, keep on going. It's you don't want to switch brands very frequently. Um, think about when you're on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter and somebody you know or a brand changes even their profile photo and you're like, who is that? Right? So you don't want to change it as often as you think. The next part of the, uh, the brand is thinking about your brand imagery. So this could be your photography or if you're doing illustrations, there's a lot of different things to kind of consider when you're pulling together images so that they look cohesive. Is your uh, genre, is it editorial or lifestyle or conceptual? Are you doing your photography outdoors or indoors or maybe studio or white box? So if you have a product shooting on white on a box, like can have those little uh, little white photography boxes to shoot your product and being consistent when you're shooting product that they look all the same when they get up. That also helps to make you look professional. When you have uh, photographs, how are they being framed? Are they right on? Are they to the side so that you can put some text? Um, and what's the spacing kind of between that your elements? Lighting is another aspect. So is it really harsh light? Is it natural? Um, is it backlit? There's a lot of different ways. And so if you can afford to work with a photographer, even, you know, once in a while, um, they really are skilled in determining a lot of these brand imagery elements and can help walk you through. Uh, human models. So if you're using humans in your photo, you know, what's, you know, their gender, what's their height, what's their ethnicity, their age, what are they wearing? Um, and how do you even create some consistency? So I've seen brands who've uh, then had very specifically chosen certain colors that align with their brand for the models to wear. So this next point is about color palette. So when you're thinking about what should be in your images, is there a way to pull out one color that kind of pops up in each of your photos to help create consistency? You don't need to do this. This is just an idea for when you're creating your brand imagery, what it looks like. And then also photo treatment. Are you retouching it so that people um, have beautiful silky skin <laughs> or are you doing a filter um, so that it changes maybe the color? Some people like to do this for Instagram where they'll choose a specific filter and use it all on their on all of their images. So it has that beautiful look. I have a few examples for you. This is a Canadian company called Unbelts and Claire uh, actually uh, developed the belt when she was living in Beijing. Uh, she was there for a few years and she was struggling with this idea of our bodies increasing and decreasing and the gap that happens in pants. And so she created this really kind of elasticy belt that could be adjusted with a clasp and um, and she has distribution all across Canada and into the United States now. She's done really well. But you can see how she's taken her logo with the red and the blue and how it's being used throughout her advertising. So um, here are a couple of ads. Actually, I think there were social media posts. And then on the right hand side is her um, website and her Instagram. So you can see like in terms of shape, she's using kind of a curvy shape um, versus kind of straight lines that, and you can find that kind of consistently throughout how she's showing up with her images. She also has a cheeky tone to her. So give yourself the gift of not seeing someone's bum. 
Um, so she has a little bit of fun, but you can see that even in her Instagram, you know, that she's using a little bit of red in her photos or a little bit of yellow. Even this is her laying on her back with her baby. Um, and, you know, she purposely has chosen to use a yellow. And it's okay that it doesn't exactly match, but it helps to create this beautiful consistency. And uh, it definitely catches the eye on social media. It can also be useful to outline the images that you don't want to use, especially if you are looking to hire um, marketing or social media people to help you, whether it's an employee or a contractor, it's good to kind of have a brand document put together. And one of the things you can do is to show what you don't want. Um, this example is from Indiana University in the United States. And they say, you know, in our photos, we want to use real people. We don't want stock photography. So we're going to make a point of shooting our own photos. And we also want them to be natural and spontaneous. So, you know, people, a group of people kind of talking versus posing. We want our photographers to pay attention to uh, details. So in the first image, she's wearing an Indiana shirt. And on the right one, they're actually wearing competitors or other schools um, hat and shirt. So being really aware of what elements are in that photo. And I like this one too, around single subject focus. So in our photos, we want to focus more on one individual versus the whole group. And in part, that's because they want to show how going to a university is a personal experience and they don't want people to feel like they're just part of a big group of numbers. So you can really see how they've outlined how they want their images to show up. And I think this is the last one on that wheel and then we'll open it up to some questions. And this is your brand experience. So when you look at your whole experience from when customers first see you, maybe they see an ad or they see you on social media, thinking about how do you interact with them from that point all the way through to purchase, as well as how do you keep them engaged from a loyalty perspective. And this is really the how you're going to deliver on their promise. And ideally you want to be um, consistent across all the interactions. Um, and sometimes this could be hard for smaller businesses, but it really can make a huge impact. So if you're kind of great at interacting with them on social media and then they go to buy and then it doesn't arrive at their place for two months, that's a inconsistent brand experience and can hurt your company. So it's really important to think about how you can create an experience for your entire, um, for your customers through, um, through buying, through being your customer. It could be even as simple as if you have a newsletter email list that you're consistent on when you send it. So maybe once a month on the first Wednesday of the month and people will come to expect that. A couple of experiences. And I like this because it's simply um, a notification that something has shipped. Normally people, you know, their automatic email would just say, this item has been shipped to blah, 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 and it'd be really boring. But this company out of the United States, they have a natural deodorant. Uh, their company is called Native. They've really taken it to the next step. Um, and uh, they like, Jennifer, your order has shipped. So a little bit of excitement. And then they go on to write, your order of Native was gently pulled down by our team of experts and placed on a gold trim pillow stuffed with the finest fibers known to man. Then a team of six inspectors examined it under a magnifying glass, ensuring it was in the perfect condition. 
So they've taken what could be a very boring, routine, ignorable email and turned it into something fun. And so they've kind of created a little bit of fun. And um, even when uh, it, you get the email confirmation that it has been purchased, they also send a fun little email about it. And by doing that, it really makes me feel loyal to them and want to uh, come back to them. In addition to, you know, our baseline is they have a good product. But if I had two products that were exactly the same, I would probably go back to the one that made me feel good, the one that I could rely on, the one that followed through on the brand promise. Example of IKEA, I was talking about that earlier. Um, so on the top left hand side, you can see an example of the experience. So you experience what it might look like, what the possibility is like. And then you get down into the bottom and, but we know as IKEA customers is that you have to go and then pick all of your pieces. Um, when COVID hit, when all the stores ended up having to shut down, um, a lot of brands were struggling with, well, what do we do online now? What's appropriate, what's not? IKEA's, um, instructions are line drawings really easy to read and so what they did is they started to give like in this case a meatball recipe so how to make it at home so they're still trying to find ways to integrate and share their brand and be helpful and show possibility um, but the other thing in terms of looking at the customer experience um, is that they really dropped the ball on delivering uh, delivery in terms of shopping online. So they weren't properly set up for it and it really hurt their brand. The bottom image is one of many, many comments on Facebook about how they, they didn't deliver in terms of being able to buy and pick it up or buy and get it delivered. And in part, that's because their system wasn't set up for something like this. However, they know it was coming. And we've seen a lot of companies um, not respond properly to the experience level. So when we went from renting CD or DVDs or videotapes to watch a movie to now Netflix and all the streaming online, there's no reason why the example in North America is Blockbuster. Um, there's no reason why that company shouldn't have been able to see that the brand experience and the experience that customers were expecting was changing. And with COVID, I've seen a lot of companies move online and they're working through how do you create a good experience online when you're used to having maybe face-to-face -face conversations or selling something in a store. And yes, it takes time, but if you want to have customers who are loyal to you, who will buy more, you really need to figure out what that experience is like. So, wow, I feel like I've talked a ton. <laughs> these are our brand elements. So these are the areas, again, that we have control over as entrepreneurs, as small business owners, and, um, we can only do our best with these things and uh, then encourage our customers to um, interact with us. If a customer's had a really good experience and they're loving our brand, make sure to ask them to write a review. Um, obviously, we know, especially online, reviews and testimonials really matter. And if you can get your best customers to share that, that will really help to build your know, like, and trust as well. So that is the end of my presentation. I'll just pop it to my, uh, okay. of course, I'd be happy to, uh, you know, 
have a conversation with you or if you have a few questions, you're welcome to email me. This is my AWE business and I'll do my best to get back to you. But I'd love to take some questions now. So I'll ask Ilya to, uh, you know, ask or invite you to put um, your uh -huh. questions in the chat and then we'll go from there. Yes, we have some certain questions already. The first question is, in what way a brand can limit or expand your success in exporting? Mm. Excellent question. Thank you. When you are looking to export, you do want to understand the market that you're moving into. Um, what, you know, the level of the the look the feel obviously language is something important um, so what i would probably suggest if you're looking to move into a new market is to spend some time talking with people in that market to understand what the situation is like uh, for example uh, to sell in canada some products have to be in both french and english especially food products and labeling um, and uh, so that's something that you would need to take into consideration. Does that answer the question? Yes, but if I should talk. Well, I hope yes. <laughs> uh, the next question that we also have, um, the the ladies, the women interpreters, they usually have some certain barriers in exporting. In what way improving your brand can help you to mitigate those barriers that the women interpreters have when they're exporting? I, I understand the, the language barrier that happens when you're moving from one country yeah, to another. No, no, I will read out. I will read out this question once again, maybe. Okay. Sure. Uh, Some barriers in exporting. Uh, in what ways can improved branding help them mitigate these barriers? Oh, for women specifically? Doc. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. If you have a, a, a brand, well, first of all, it depends who you're trying to target to, what your product is and um, who you're going, who you want to sell to in that other country. Trying to understand who they are and what resonates with them is going to be super important. And then understanding if your brand may or may not have to shift a bit. Sometimes a really well-established brand can help you because it looks professional and it's global. Um, but as women entrepreneurs, if you have a professional looking brand, it will help gain you credibility in different markets. And if they can go on your, on your website, Thankfully, we have Google uh, Translate and, you know, read and get a sense for your brand story, <laughs> how it came up, um, you know, the colors and the feel, and uh, mm -hmm. that can all really help you um, in terms of yeah, 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 yeah. help the target audience understand who you are and why they should care. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, can we get to the next question then? Sure, please. So, Canadian Ukraine, the Canada Ukraine Agreement on Free Trade, gives the opportunity to Ukrainian companies to export to Canada. Do you know any of Ukrainian brands that are widely known in Canada? What do you believe what the types of messages should Ukrainian brands offer in order to be attractive to Canadian customers? Great question. And to be honest, I don't think I am familiar 
specifically with any Ukrainian brands that have come in, um, which makes me feel awful. <laughs> um, I think, I think it, the, this program has been really great in terms of being able to connect the two markets and to give support. Um, one, a brand I think is as good as it is by being consistent and, and that all of these elements are put together. So, and like I said, it really depends on your target market. So if you are um, a manufacturer of furniture, let's say, are you targeting a higher income bracket? And so then those, the a brand for kind of a higher income bracket might look a lot more modern and, you know, white and architectural, where if you are um, exporting, let's see, um, what would be another good example? Let's say you're exporting some food product and it's for, you know, moms with busy lives, then your brand really should kind of speak to the benefits of that. So, you know, maybe it's bright and it's uh, fun and easy. And so in the language that you're using in, in your brand, um, you want to show that it's fun and easy and tastes good. So it's not one brand will do better than another. It's really around when you're developing your brand, you have your customer in mind. That help? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Another question um, that we have. So what are the values? What values should Ukrainian brands offer in order to export to Canada successfully? Mm. Again, it's similar to, um, similar to understanding who your target audience, who's going to buy. Um, so I think as a baseline, uh, Canadian customers obviously want what Ukrainian customers want. They want, you know, professionalism, quality, things that they can rely on. Um, but that's, like I said, the baseline. And then what values that are more important really depends on your target market. So a, a busy mom, they, they really value time and making it easy. So those would be you know, brand values that you would create. So maybe you don't write really long essays about your product. Maybe you're just providing quick recipes that can be done in five minutes or 10 minutes, um, where maybe for the furniture example, um, the value might be craftsmanship and um, elegance um, and so that would come across in your brand in terms of how you would write your story and how you would um, connect with, with people. And so once you get past that baseline, which probably everybody, you know, globally are kind of looking for when they go to purchase a product or service, then it, your brand values um, hopefully should align with your target audience uh, brand values. Thank you. And another question that we have, I know that the issue of the gender equality and the support for the female entrepreneurs is the mainstream and baseline for your organization. So why do you grant the support for women entrepreneurs? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, women are still not receiving the same amount of funding, uh, support, and they don't have the, as large of businesses as um, men do in Canada. And so our organization has been around for 25 years and we hear lots of stories from women who said, you know, we would have never started our business if we hadn't gotten funding from you because the banks ignored us or talked down to us. Or when we went to talk to investors, they ignored us. So unfortunately, 
these biases still exist in Canada. Um, and our organization really helps to create a safe space also for women to understand, to learn, to support one another, um, where they're not talked down to or demeaned, um, that they feel supported and, uh, and connected with each other as well as getting the funding they need to build their business. So yes, they would have to have a, a good business case. We still make sure that the business fundamentals are there. But if they are, then we'd like to um, provide them with the funding as well as we don't just like a bank fund them and leave. So we're with them for the five years that they have their financing through us. And that means we're, we're talking at least annually a lot of them will talk to a few times a year make sure that they have the resources that they need if they need help um, we try to connect them with other people and uh, so that support is still needed i hope one day it won't be needed <laughs> but i think we're still a long way from that thank you so much for asking that question Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, we also have another question. So how do you certify logo? I do believe that is a question. How do you certify a logo uh, in Canada? And how do you work with a copyright for the logo? And how can you make the different gradients for colors if you're using online programs or online software? But I think that we can readdress this second part of the question to a graphic designer more <laughs> yeah sure that sounds good so in canada you want to register your brand so your logo um and any kind of specific elements that you want to have uh, copyrighted with the um, ip office the intellectual uh, property office um, and it can be done online um, maybe after I'll send a link to it so you can see it's about a, about four hundred dollars Canadian to register and protect your brand um, which I, I would recommend especially if you're making the investment into coming into Canada um, and so that the process is a bit long but we go by um, the rules that if you file that first, then it's yours. There are some cases where, um, of course, your logo is kind of easier to be able to um, copyright. Sometimes the name is, you may or may not be able to get to copyright, depends how common it is. Um, you know, if it's shoe, then we don't allow copyright of a basic word. Um, but I can send a, an email and uh, the organizer can help forward that along. Um, for the purposes of just kind of your logo name, you don't need to have a lawyer to help file that. If you need uh, to file a patent, so based on like technology or um, a process, then you probably need to work with uh, an IP lawyer but I will send that along so then you can get a bit more information on it. And the gradient, I agree. Let's uh, leave that to the uh, graphic designer to answer. <laughs> yes, I, I do agree with that. Also, thank you. Uh, we have another question. Can you please give us an example of failures and the prevailing obstacles in the brand development? And the very same question. Failures and prevailing obstacles development. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Um, so one of the things when you're developing a brand, one thing you want to do is just do it. A lot of people, they you know, change and wobble and they decide that they won't, you know, they take a long time to make a decision. But part of it is just writing out each of those areas and determining what that's going to be. And then the key is to take action on it. But if you document first, even your logo, your colors, your uh, the 
types of photos you want to use and are consistent with that, that really helps to start to build a really strong brand. So yeah, the first thing would be actually doing it. The second uh, would be is when you can afford to hire a graphic artist, I would do that because they're trained in that area. Um, and there are, you know, certain design concepts that they understand that can make it look really professional. Um, it's okay to, um, if you're just starting out to kind of create your own brand, there's a few programs online to do, or your own logo. There's a few brand, uh, things online to be able to do that. Um, so that, but when you can invest in a uh, graphic artist, and you can see when I showed the bold leadership one, how beautifully it was put together and it was really clear then how to take that and, and use it. Um, the other mistake that I see people making is they change the brand too frequently and it loses awareness and momentum. Um, you know, if it's a small update, it's like if you want to change one color or if you want to change one value, like you find that you want to focus, um, you know, maybe you want to have a more uh, humorous brand and you haven't in the past that's okay, you can kind of change some of those things. But if you go for a wholehearted change, it really um, stops any sort of momentum that you're, you're building. So I hope those couple of tips help with uh, things to be aware of when you're building your brand. Um, one clarification. Yes, thank you very much for your answer. There is one clarification. Um, what brands have failed? Ooh. Maybe have any examples. You know what? I don't know which brands have failed because they never showed up. Right? So they never got on a radar um usually the brands that we're most aware of are the most successful so i showed you at the beginning the at least the logo of the little local coffee shop um you know if their business and if they're not consistent with that using it um and delivering on their customer experience then that that company will fail and so it, it's there aren't, as far as I'm aware, any big failures of brands. Oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> Gap, um, which is a clothing company, they tried to rebrand and they tried to crowdsource their brand and it was a complete failure. Um, it didn't, the intent was nice, but the general public are not designers. And so the outcome was that they ended up moving back to their old brand. And it, that shows that when you have a strong brand, people become really attached to it and they don't really like change in general. People don't like change. Um, so I would say most successful brands are successful because they've been consistent. Um, and the ones that fail um, are usually end up in a company's failure. Um, and you don't need to have a global brand. It, if you have a brand that's, you know, really well known in Kiev, that's great. You know, as long as your target audience knows who you are and you're reaching them, that's great. Um, but yeah, I'm finding if brands fail when they are inconsistent, when they change a lot, um, or they're trying to be something that they're not as well. I hope that helps on the brand failure. Yes, thank you. And we have another interesting question. Is there any difference in promoting brands online and through social media? Uh, compared, so online and social media? Uh, in comparison to the two? Yes, like comparing offline and social media, what's the difference? 
Yeah, so um, I think it's the approach in a way should be the same in that, you know, whatever you're producing and the experience should be um, similar offline and online. So the benefit of being online is you can reach a much greater audience. You're not stuck to a retail offline uh, store. Um, there is also a history of what you do online. So people can scroll back through your Instagram and Facebook and see how you've responded, how you've engaged, um, see the ratings. And especially when it comes to uh, online rankings and ratings, that's very much more visible than offline. So you might have word of mouth on both of those, but the word of mouth really spreads super fast online. Um, there are, you know, it depends on what you're trying to sell. Um, but I think having an online presence, even if you are primarily selling uh, in person in a retail store, having an online presence helps people to do the research before they arrive. A lot of a lot of customers will already have researched and figured out what they wanted before they ever come to buy, especially in person. And also being online, that really is a beautiful opportunity for you to showcase your brand and your company and your values. Um, so, you know, both ways can be successful, but definitely like online allows you to reach a much bigger audience. Um, have a little bit of uh, history so people can see how you've uh, integrated and also it allows you to provide more information than you would necessarily do in store or in person, um, which I think really just helps customers to make a better buying decision. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Jennifer. We have another question. And I will read it out in English. Is it important to have a brand for a one person business that provides educational services such as choosing a school abroad or writing documents in English? Oh, in relation to a personal brand? Yes, probably, probably yes. I would like to ask our participants who has posted this question maybe to clarify this question, what she meant by that. Yeah. Well, I can comment about having a personal brand. There's definitely a movement to individuals just getting clear on their values and what matters to them um, and how they show up. So that's a bit of self-awareness so that they can be consistent in how they're showing up. So for example, if I um, came here, like I've shown up professional, I like bright colors, I have a, a green screen behind me so it's nicely lit. And so I came here um, with my personal brand. But if I had come like this and like bright red lipstick, it would be a very different experience about how you show up. And so when you're developing your, your personal brand and how you write, it can be really helpful to have guidelines for how you want to um, show yourself. And I think in terms of the example of, you know, applying for things or, or um, you know, even if you are guest writing for another website, to have your voice stand out in the way that you want it to can be really powerful and helps to make you more memorable as well versus a very, you know, nondescript, bland, professional, boringness. People won't remember that quite as much. Was there a further follow on to that question or clarification? 
Чи потребує цей бізнес бренду? Does this business need a brand? So basically, if you're providing educational consulting on like how people can choose a school or university, or if you're helping them to get better in writing in English, and if this is what you do, this is the service you provide, does that kind of services needs and that kind of business needs a brand or a logo? I would say yes if you want to position yourself as a company if it's just you as a freelancer um maybe not but it's still your personal brand so i would say yes i would invest <clears throat> in thinking through all those elements and it doesn't need to be too complex um this presentation looks complex but you could literally take each section and say okay you know what's my promise my promise is around um helping you to get into your university of choice or helping to improve your english writing skills um you know in terms of colors what sort of colors resonate with those people who are looking for your business but yeah taking the time to think through all of those pieces um will help you to build better awareness for your brand and a uh, better uh, loyalty, word of mouth. If people can see that you're professional and that you have this visual as well as emotional aspects pulled together, it can really help build your business. Thanks for clarifying. Thank you, Jennifer, for the Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the answer. And I would like to thank all of our participants for very interesting, intriguing questions. Maybe you have any more questions left? Because I can see the new questions still in the chat box. Sure. So maybe, maybe there's something else that you would like to add, Jennifer? Oh, to this? Um, I... My biggest piece of advice is just to keep going. There's uh, entrepreneurial journeys are up and down and, you know, we almost ride the highs of highs and the low of lows, but um, keep going, uh, find people, a community advisor or coach that can help support you through all of those points and uh, ask a lot of questions, get really curious. A uh, really quick example, I guess, of remember when I shared uh, unbelts, the stretchy belt. Uh, the owner, Claire, was speaking and someone came up to her and said, I love your belts. And instead of saying, okay, thanks, she said, oh, okay, tell me more. What do you like about them? And she found out that this woman uh, rides horses, equestrian, and this was a brand new market that opened up to her. And she said, you know what, for one year, I'm going to spend all my effort in this really small niche. And um, she was able to get the best riders. Attending the trade shows was way less expensive than going to a big trade show in Toronto for accessories. And um, in terms of riding, the belt is the least expensive part. And it was young girls, and so they wanted all the colors. So by actually narrowing in, being super curious, she was actually able to grow her brand faster that way. So um, keep going, get asked for help, and, um, and be curious. Really listen to what your customers are saying and uh, explore. So those would be my three tips that I would want to leave you with. Jennifer, дуже дякуємо вам за цей чуд. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Thank you very much for this magnificent presentation. So, dear participants, uh, thank you very much for listening to us. We had Jennifer Horwath with us, the business consultant for the women entrepreneurs from Alberta. And I would like to tell you that you can re-watch this webinar in a couple of days and you will receive the link for the recorded version of this webinar in both English and Ukrainian and you will receive a presentation as well. Thank you very much for spending this time with us. And the information you have shared with us. Best wishes from Ukraine. Goodbye. Do
Ďakujem všetkým. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone and goodbye.